I'm Nick Newton, joined by Will Miles. Welcome to the game week version of Stand Up and Holler. We'll be talking a lot about Florida and Utah on this week's episode. We've been coming at you week after week during the offseason, and we're finally to the best time of the year on tonight's episode. We got a special guest for you, Gator Dave from Gators Breakdown. He'll join the show to talk about the Florida defense against the Utah offense. It's going to be a tough matchup against the Utes there for Patrick Tony's defense. Expectations for Anthony Richardson and the offense in, in four bits with just Will and I. And then Mamu Diabate comes back to the swamp. Interesting week one matchup. Don't see that a whole lot. Uh, maybe in the transfer reporter era, you're starting to see it a little more, but we haven't seen that a whole lot in the past with Florida football. And we'll cap it off with as big as this game is with Utah, a little perspective on season openers and why Kentucky might be the more important game next week uh, after this massive, massive game against Utah. Will, how's it going tonight, man? It's going awesome, dude. It's it's game week, right? I mean, you spend all off season talking about numbers and talking about recruiting and talking about development and talking about, you know, Napier and all of his plans and the transition and all that stuff. And we're finally at a point where the debate is not over, but the debate starts in a different forum, which is, you know, obviously we get to see what Florida has when they go out there and get to see what they have against a serious, serious opponent. I mean, Utah, I, I think there are a lot of people who think Utah may be overrated. I think I may actually be one of them. But at the same time, we all realize that this is a quality, quality team coming into the swamp. And so Napier has an opportunity to put his stamp on this era. He has an ability to come in and immediately do something that Mullen struggled with, right? Beating top 10 teams was not something that Florida was known for during the Dan Mullen era. So to be able to come in, put his stamp on it, absolutely sort of put his foot on the throat of the, any sort of narrative that this this might be a little bit of a slow rebuild, you know, at that point, um, you know, so really announce his presence. And, and that's a cool opportunity. Like you said, we're going to talk about whether this one's critical. And I think, you know, obviously it's the first game in the era and it's a brand new, brand new staff. And, um, you know, it may not go the way we want it to go, but at the same time, man, is it exciting to have this underway, to have something to talk about every week and to have college football back in our lives, right? I mean, God, we already got to see Scott Frost, Nebraska GAC one up. We got to see uh, Vanderbilt look like they got the old head ball coach there as their, as their offensive coordinator put going up and down the field against Hawaii um, you know so the week zero games and, and and we got to see Florida State beat Duquesne in a way that I guess means something I have no idea but uh, you know look week zero college football always sort of gets the juices flowing it's not like preseason in the NFL where you've got these sort of like first two series and then you don't pay any attention or anything like that it's like the the pedal hits the metal the minute it starts and, and it's awesome dude you know a call is bad when it's a, not a team that you necessarily follow, and you're just furious watching the game. What that onside kick with Scott Frost up 28 17, saying that he had the numbers and he'd do it again. Come on, man. Come no, on. See that? No, see, that's the thing. I wish he'd said that. Like what he said was, yeah, well, looking at the result, I wouldn't do it again. And I'm like, no, no, either you do it because it makes sense and because that's the right thing to do. Or you don't do it because it's the wrong thing to do and the numbers say you shouldn't do it. That is how you should coach football. And quite honestly, that's how you end up just never being able to win a close game. I saw somebody post a stat today that if Nebraska wins 50 straight, he'll still have a worse record than Bo Pelini. And that's only because he's like 0-35 in one-score games. And that's because he oscillates back and forth between what he should do. You know, we had a little bit of fun with the Kirby Award last year and, uh, you know, we're not going to retire it because we don't let Georgia dictate what we do around here. But, you know, Frost got like five of them last year. And let me just say the week zero Kirby absolutely going to Scott Frost, not because of the call. I think the onside kick call is defensible. I don't think it's great, but I think it's defensible. I think the problem is, is that afterwards he's second guessing himself and saying, well, I guess I wouldn't have done it now that I've seen the result. And what that reflects to me is somebody who's going through a poor process. And thank God, hallelujah, that's not what we have in Gainesville. Because if there's one thing that Billy Napier is, it is process oriented. So when he comes off, if he tries an onside kick against Utah, I expect him to go, heck yeah, I'd do it again. The numbers said it was the right thing to do. And quite honestly, that's what coaches need to be doing in this in this day and era. Yeah, you went three and nine. You lost a ton of games by one score. And you're like, yeah, you know what? 
up by 11 feeling this onside kick let's go let's do it you, uh, we are I, the guys I who had think... kevin kelly on earlier and all you know earlier this offseason all he does is onside kick so i'm not about to criticize somebody for an onside kick i'm going to criticize that they immediately walked it back and said i wouldn't have done it afterwards and you know the, the honest truth is if you think that it's the right call you make the call and you stand behind it not just take responsibility for it but say heck yeah I'd do it again like, cause outcome does not dictate what I would do. And maybe Nebraska fans wouldn't like that, but they should, because that's what you should want to coach. Kevin Camille, Ke- Kevin Kelly's committed to that process. It's not a one-off thing. Terrible call in that situation. But <laughs> again, sitting here furious about a Nebraska game, it shows the level of the call on another side note. Is Vandy going to win the sec? Uh, no, but I okay. think you and I, I think it's interesting. Cause I think you and I really like what Clark Lee and really like what Barton Simmons are doing there. Yep. And I don't think they're going to be a pushover for too much longer. You look at the recruiting results, you look at what they put on the field with, with right there at quarterback. I think they're going to give some people some trouble this year. That's still, I'm still picking Vandy to go. zero and eight in the conference, but you know, there's going to be an opportunity for them to come up and snipe somebody and you're going to have to take Vandy seriously. Maybe not this year, but I think next year, especially you're going to have to take Vandy seriously in the conference conference and quite honestly that's good for the conference right you don't just want somebody who's an easy easy win every time you go out there though as a florida fan i'm fine with them being a doormat because you know that bye week is always kind of nice <laughs> yeah good stuff there all right well we're delaying too much for gator dave we got to get to gator dave here at two bits all right we're kicking off two bits here want to welcome gator dave of gators breakdown uh for his first appearance on stand up and holler thank you for joining the show tonight gator dave fired up to have you yeah, yeah, it's uh, you guys have been going for a while and uh, get, guessing it up here to kick the season off. I'm uh, glad to be a part of it. Yeah, yeah, th- thanks for joining, man. So, we're, we're gonna focus on the Gator defense here for two bits tonight. Uh, Utah quarterback Cam Rising will be a tough assignment right out of the gate for this defense. Let's talk about Rising's game for a minute here. I, I've watched a bunch of him the last few days. We were talking about it a little bit before we got on here, but I, I just think he's a super athletic quarterback, the type that will make third and four an absolute nightmare. He plays with a ton of confidence, almost to a fault, though. He'll he'll take his chances. I think Tony's got a chance to uh, really bait him on a couple opportunities, and, and he'll take some risks. But, Dave, the question I have for you out of the gate is, will Cam Rising be the best quarterback Florida faces this season? I don't think so. I, I think you take a look at like, – there's a couple ways to look at it for me. Pure quarterback, he might be, but I think you've got to factor in type of offense and who he is surrounded by. And as far as potential goes, that could go to Tennessee and Hendon Hooker with the potential of the offense there, uh, as bad as we don't want to hear it. And I'm not saying they're going to go <laughs> score 40 points on Florida, but you know that potential is there based off of Josh Heupel's offense – what we saw last year from Hendon Hooker as the year went on, got better and better. Uh, but still, you know, you go back and look at the better teams they played last year, still pretty much struggled uh, there, did, did Hendon Hooker. But honestly, as much as I hate to say it, I probably got to go Stetson Bennett in Georgia. I mean, mm-hmm. Cam Rising and and Stetson Bennett, I mean, Cam Rising probably a better quarterback. But once you put Stetson Bennett in that Georgia offense, and if he plays like he did in that national championship game on a more consistent basis, then – I mean, I, he, he, he to me, he would be the best quarterback for Florida plays all year. Now, are we going by draft rankings and, and an SEC, you know, ranking like power ranking the quarterback? No, Stetson Bennett's not going to be up there with, you know, the, the best of the SEC quarterbacks. But once you put him in that offense, put him the, the skill players that Georgia has, especially at their tight end slash wide receiver roles, go and look at it, Stetson Bennett. If he plays anything like he did in the playoffs last year versus Michigan and, and Alabama, he's going to be the best quarterback Florida faces. That, that, that that's sort of that's sort of saying a lot though isn't it that these guys have to be the consistent version of their excellent selves and that yeah. i guess that's kind of the sort of the story of <laughs> florida too when you think about richardson is you know it's going to be a question of consistency not a question of necessarily the top gear though I don't, I don't know i think you could argue that that richardson has a has a higher gear than both uh both bennett and certainly levis right in, in terms of some of the guys that yeah, I, didn't even, I didn't even name levis but that probably tells you what i think about him so <laughs> <laughs> just not how i mean i'm just uh, wando robinson was such a huge part of that offense last year almost 50 percent of the the catches went to him i think it was 41 percent uh, of levis's passes went to wando robinson they're all going to be without Christopher Rodriguez to carry that running game the first part of the season. I'm just I, – I, I, 
Look, well, I, went, I, I, I went high on Kentucky last year either, and they, and they kind of, you know, stuffed my foot in my mouth that after that one. But especially for Florida, you know, Florida didn't play their best that game. Florida plays any 1% better. They probably win that game. I'm just – after losing Robinson, I, I just don't know where Will Levis goes. And and a change at offensive coordinator again, too. Yeah, I'm, I just want to create – I'm trying to create a little perspective here. If you have – for a lot of Gator fans, probably haven't watched a ton of Utah football out there. And Levis, you got Bohannon coming in from USF as well, the starter for the Big 12 champs last year at, at Baylor. Really looking through the schedule here, you're looking at, you know, outside of Eastern Washington, you're talking about – Daniels or Nussmeyer coming in for LSU. Stetson Bennett. Haynes King was named the starter at AM. Rattler at South Carolina. Right. Vandy looked good on Saturday night, right? Against Hawaii. Jordan Travis, mid level quarterback, right? I, but do you think this is top to bottom for the schedule this year with Rising coming in to, to kick it off? It usually feels like a couple games a year the Gators have a team with an unsettled quarterback situation coming into town or they're playing that week. I, I feel like top to bottom, this is a real strong schedule for quarterbacks this year with this team yeah for florida i mean florida's actually gotten pretty relatively lucky i guess under the last regime and there wasn't a whole lot of quarterbacks uh, i don't think as the sec top the bottom and on the schedule but talking about to make it look good anyway uh but it's yeah you look at it this is probably pretty deep at a&m they're gonna at least get serviceable serviceable play at quarterback they were mm-hmm. king and a uh, rattler if he's just i guess in between what he showed the last two years, he's probably an improvement there for South Carolina at the same time. And I know they, they went transfer crazy uh, for, for that offense, and especially starting with him. LSU, I don't know what they're going to do. Uh, Daniels was not very impressive at Arizona State. When you, when you go back and look at it, he just got worse as he came on the or came on the rise. You know, or, you know, when we first heard his name, it was because he came in right away and did some good things and got thrust in the spotlight right away and never really lived up to that expectation again. And uh, Garrett Nussmeyer is just no, no experience. So you, you wonder where Brian Kelly goes with that. I mean, it's uh, – I. And who probably whoever wins that job, I think, will probably do a good job for LSU. Brian Kelly has a lot of success with average quarterbacks at, at Notre Dame, so he's gonna mm-hmm. he's gonna get something out of them. But Jordan Travis, I mean, you couldn't beat the lame duck Gator staff last year. I know doesn't and it doesn't give me a whole lot of confidence, uh, that, you know, going into this year either. So I probably start Stetson Bennett one, but yeah, Cameron Rising, if we want to go there, where, where you started this conversation, I'd probably put him at two. And 2A, 2B with Hooker. I mean, I, I do like the potential of Hooker in Tennessee. Yeah, tough tough assignment for the Gators out the gate there, Will, with Ryan. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think let, let's not turn this guy into into the next coming of, of Danny Werfel or anything. I mean, so everybody knows how I like high school completion percentage. He completed 52% of his passes his senior year, averaged less than 10 yards in attempt, actually less than eight yards in attempt when he was in high school. You start looking at what he did last year in college. I think he outperformed what many of us would have thought the expectations would be 64% completion, but only 7.8 yards per attempt. So he was right around sort of where the average quarterback is. So he had a lot of highs but it wasn't like he didn't have any lows 20 touchdowns five interceptions I think maybe that's the thing that you look for when you look at how Florida is going to perform here is if they can get some turnovers then you get sort of the bad rising because he's not that efficient going down the field now he was against an Ohio State team and certainly he's able to rush the ball so 74 attempts for 499 yards last year and so if he's able to extend plays if he's able to get the Florida defensive backs out of position and he's able to exploit them down the field then okay, maybe he can have one of those games like he did against Ohio State. But it's not as though Ohio State had all their players. And that's, I think, sort of the recency bias of looking at a team like Ohio State. I mean, if we think about a team that sort of thought they should be playing for a national championship and then went to a bowl game and sort of laid down, you don't have to go too far if you're a Florida fan to remember that sort of situation. We remember what happened to them against Oklahoma. So I start asking myself that question, right? That yes, Utah performed well with Ohio State last year, but Ohio State was missing a lot of guys. They've got a lot of guys who, you know, were ready going ready to go to the NFL. Were the guys who showed up really all that motivated? Or did they just sort of have a bad first half and then turn it on to make sure they got the W at the end of that game? I don't know the answer to that question. So I think it's really dangerous to look at bowl games specifically and try to project what someone's going to be in this day and age. I mean, you, you know, it used to be everybody played in a bowl game. So you could look at it and say, hey, they built momentum for the next year. Or, hey, you know, that, that that team sort of fell flat. But now I think you just sort of look at it and say bowl games are kind of a complete separate animal. And so then you got to go back and look at the schedule. 
The only real impressive wins on that schedule are the Oregon wins. Granted, those are impressive, but Cristobal kind of had one foot out the door there too. So there are a few mitigating circumstances when you think about what was going on that make me think that perhaps rising is good, but I don't think he's great. And I think you look at his high school stats, where his college stats wound up, and I don't know that there's another step for him to take, which means... You know, I, I think in terms of overall efficiency, Richardson and Rising were pretty close to each other. Just Richardson didn't get the same number of touches. And so now it's a question of does the mobility of Rising, which is a little bit surprising, I think, when you really sort of think of, when you look at it, does that mobility open things up down the field for a new Florida secondary or a secondary that's dealing with a new new scheme? Well, we, we did see Rising have a great game in the Rose Bowl against Ohio State at that long touchdown run, which goes to show you really need to wrap up on this guy when he's running. So he's going to be a physical runner. Uh, also, there's another there's a reason why Ohio State paid a boatload of money to get Oklahoma State uh, defense coordinator Jim Knowles over into Columbus this year. It wasn't the best defense in Ohio State last year there. But, Dave, looking at this Utah offense under Kyle Whittingham, they're typically known for their physicality, that run game. Like They want to run the ball and play defense typically. So Rising does bring that extra element in the pass game this last couple of years here. But you're looking at two preseason all Pac-12 uh, selections here, first team all Pac-12, running back Tavian Thomas and tight end Brant. Keefe as key weapons coming in uh you know Keefe definitely he's got another tight end there uh Dalton Kincaid I believe is his, mm-hmm. his name they're going to be weapons up the middle there for rising but man Tavian Thomas dude is a tank guy's an absolute tank you talk about having to wrap up two, and bring the guy down it's 246 pa- 246 pounds I think Ooh. I saw it, uh man two. looks NFL ready right now I mean here's the thing Florida's linebackers is the most important position group on the field Versus Utah, when you go, when you got these two tight ends, no, don't, don't get me wrong, Florida's going to probably play some secondary guys to help cover Keithy as well. But you know, there's going to be some linebackers involved at the same time. How much do you spy rising? How much do you play these linebackers on these tight ends? And then, of course, they're going to have to be involved in stopping uh, Thomas as well. So Florida's linebackers have a chore uh, when they when they play Utah. And you know, how many linebackers does Florida put on the field? Who do they? Because, look, as much as we know it's important to bring Ventrell Miller back to stop somebody like Thomas, when Keithy's on the field and they want to use Keithy, we know Ventrell Miller throughout his career has been in liability in pass coverage. Mm. You know, so does that mean more playing time for Derek Wingo? Does that mean more playing time for Scooby Williams, Shamar James, DeWan Black? Uh, it, probably more in, in, in what you know the passing situation. I mean, Miller's probably going to come off the field in that situation anyway. But I'm telling you, Florida's linebackers have their hands full – with the quarterback position, inspiring rise, inspiring rising, Tavion Thomas get, getting that big bodied, physical bruising attack there at the running back position, and these two tight ends that Utah's bring is uh, bring bring it to the table as well. So Florida's linebackers better be ready Saturday night. Also going to test that defensive line depth, right? That's something we talked about all off season. What what are you looking for? out of the defensive line on Saturday night early on? You, you got to think Whittingham's going to come test that right away, right? Somebody besides Jervon Dexter to, to have their name called is what, is what I'll be looking for. <laughs> and, and, and what does that mean for somebody like Tyreek Sapp? Because we've heard some whispers and we've kind of heard around the block that he could play tackle a little bit if needed to. I don't think that's his best position, but he may be asked to play there a little bit there uh, to give Jervon Dexter either a breather or they put them both. If Utah gets that ground game going, if they – have some early success. Do you put Sap out there as well as another playmaker uh, along the defensive line at that defensive tackle spot, maybe even uh, closer to the middle uh, as well? So, you know, Desmond Watson, how many snaps does he play? That yeah. That's probably the biggest question along the defensive line besides who can help Jervon Dexter. In relation to that, it's going to be, well, how many snaps is, is, is it that Watson is playing? I, I expect him to see – I expect to see him early in the game then probably strategically put him in throughout the game. You don't want to get him caught out there where it's a third and short Utah converts. And if they've done enough homework, okay, well, now we might can speed the game up a little bit. We'll get keep Watson on the field and we'll make it where he has to play snap after snap after snap. So I think Florida's got to be pretty strategic if he's not conditioned enough. Get him to start with, put him out there, and then have him ready for the fourth quarter if it's a close game and you need his body out there uh for you know to help stop that run game so it, it's to have somebody else besides dexter and i'm the two names i'm looking at are the importance of sap and watson so w- will we talked about the young defensive line here 
how how do you feel about these linebackers coming into this game with uh, who do you expect which young linebacker do you expect to kind of play a role we're not quite expecting today like you see a Derek Wingo stepping up Scooby Williams Shamar James any names like that jumping out to you I mean, honestly, I have no idea. I think Ventrell Miller's going to have to play well. I think Amari Bernie's going to have to play well, right? I mean, I think the guys who have been there for a while are going to have to perform in some capacity. Now, the good news is is that, you know, in terms of overall gashing run plays and those sorts of things, I'm not sure they'll necessarily uh, – I, I guess my my point is, is that I think Florida's going to be – um, I think you're going to be able to get Florida on the ground up the middle sometimes. I think some of the times that'll be the defensive line. I think sometimes that'll be the linebackers. The question is going to be, can you take the top off the defense? I think that's actually um, – that should be comforting to Gator fans, right? When you sit there and say, look, this team may be able to pound you a little bit inside, but can you sort of make them march it down the field, go 14 plays, 18 plays, you know, stuff like that in order to get the ball in the end zone. And then can you stop them when the field starts to shrink and all of a sudden you don't have to cover quite as much space. I, I expect Utah to be able to move the ball a little bit. I don't, I don't expect Florida to complete, completely be able to shut them down. I think you get a couple of big sacks on rising. Brenton Cox coming off the end, I think is probably going to be one of the big keys is can can he win one on one battles and can he set up double teams to where they get one on one battles in other spaces? That'll probably be the big to me. That'll be the big key. And then Tony's going to have people coming from everywhere. So you talk about the linebackers and the young guys who might make a difference. I think that's kind of where you're probably going to see the difference maker is could a guy like Scooby Williams get freed up and have a free shot at rising or a free shot at the mesh point between the running back and the quarterback and be able to cause a turnover. Those are the sorts of things that they're going to have to take advantage of that. Utah is going to be able to move the ball. The question is, can you get enough pressure on rising that he throws a few up? Because Florida's secondary is pretty good. Mm -hmm. And so I think you might be able to get a lot more turnovers. And the thing that I think maybe makes me a little bit more sanguine about this than anything else is that Tony and all of the players to a man have talked about how much they've worked on tackling and how much they've worked on making sure they run through the guy's hip and all those sorts of things. And so I think one of the things that got frustrating in a few games last year is you'd have guys in the right position and they couldn't bring the guy down on like a big third and five or a big third and seven. And all of a sudden they were able to sidestep it and go. It only takes a couple of those plays to be able to get yourself off the field. And, uh, you know, the last couple of years, that just hasn't happened for Florida. In fact, the one key time they did, they chucked a shoe 30, 30 yards downfield. And uh, obviously that didn't turn out so well. Hey, I, I really – look, I, I know I know we're in the SEC – Football's king down here, right? This Utah team coming in, Pac-12 champions. Not trying to give them too much respect, guys, but we just – we got to look at this offense. This could be tough offense to stop. So what in your mind, Dave, is the successful outing for Patrick Tony's first first shot here in the swamp against Utah? How many points are you looking at? What type of, you know, scenarios are you looking at? What, what in your mind would be a successful outing for this defense? Jokingly, one less than whatever Florida has. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, oh, man. you In a first game, I, I I would – I'd give a little bit of a pass anyway, but you got to – I mean, 30 points is probably the barometer, right? If if Utah scores over 30, how confident are you in winning that game? And, and mm -hmm. that goes – I know it's relation to Florida's offense at the same time, but – you probably wouldn't be happy with it, and you probably would put it at a forty percent chance Florida win. Or I would, you know, I probably put it at a forty percent. If if Utah scores 30, 40 percent chance Florida wins that Let, game. Let's ask you this way, Dave. Yeah, how confident are you that they hold Utah under twenty four? What was Utah's average last year? Thirty? Was it thirty one? I, I don't know. If I'm, I'm kind of. Hold on, I'll look it up real okay, quick. You yeah, guys I, talk. I'll I'll figure it out. So yeah, I, I think it's around. It might even be 37. I don't want to go that high because that's probably really high. I mean, 36, 36.1. 36, 36. Okay. As soon as I said 30, I was like, no, I should think it was higher than that. Okay. So 30 actually would be pretty good then, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, for a first year defense and stuff, I mean, yeah. Um, in today's college football, I mean, it's a win if you hold a team to 24 points, 27 points, uh, I, I think. Now, it, throughout the season, you'd want to see that a lot lower uh, for the better defenses out there. 16, 17 points a game. I think in, in today's college football is, is okay. Uh, and, but in Florida's first year, I, I guess, you know, going against this Utah team, top 10 team, a successful offense, I mean, 27 points, I guess I, I, I'd be, I'd be okay with that. I would feel like Florida 
offensively should do enough to get in that range as, as well. Um, so if I had to put a point total on it, um, I guess, you know, 27. But here's the thing. This game could play out like – go back to last year's Alabama game. Utah – I mean, Alabama had 21 yeah. points right off the board. And then Florida's defense settled in, did some yeah. nice things, got them back in the game actually uh, a bit. You know, it, it could play out that way a little bit too where – Maybe just have to follow the storyline uh, of the game. Utah could jump up quick and defense settles in the first game of the season. You just miscommunication. You don't know what to expect in, in, in this new defense. But uh, I'd probably be put, yeah, a, like a 27-point total on there. Same question, Will. Well, I mean, that may be a problem because Utah only scored less than 31 twice last year. Now, I will say on the road, they lost yeah. 26 to 17 to BYU. They lost 33 to 31 to San Diego State. They beat a USC team that was about to fire its coach or maybe already had fired its coach. And then they lost to Oregon State on the road. And then mm. they beat Stanford and Arizona, who weren't any good on the road. Um, and, you know, they, they destroyed Stanford. But the Arizona game was a nine-point game. So – I think there's a little bit of a Jekyll and Hyde here, home road type of type of thing that the swamp is going to come in and make an effect. And look, Florida, I think only wins this game. If they hold them to say 24, I think 27, you're pushing it. I, I think first start for real first, real start for Anthony Richardson. I mean, obviously start against Georgia, but going back and forth with Emory Jones, that was sort of a weird situation. You know, now this is his team. His first start is his team. Um, you know, you know, Billy Napier is going to try to run the ball and you suspect, or at least I suspect, he's going to try to make Utah cramp up. And so a couple of turnovers by the Florida defense, if they're able to keep the ball on the ground, shorten the game, and then rely on Richardson's big explosive plays, I actually think this is going to be a lower scoring game. This isn't going to be a wide open Pac-12, hey, we're trying to go up and down the field. And quite honestly, I don't think Utah has those wes those weapons that Alabama had last year. And so if you think that Florida's defense can be a little bit better this year, you think Napier's going to try to take the air out of the ball a little bit. Um, I think 24 is probably the line where you get to 27, you're really starting to push it in terms of whether Florida's offense can be able to keep up. Yeah, it's going to be a big ask for the defense here. Uh, Dave, last question here. In your mind, defense comes out, plays well, they hold them to that 24 what what do you think the storyline of the game is? Do do you think they worked on they shut down the run, created a couple turnovers? What what do you what do you oh. think it could happen on that? Turnovers would definitely be in there, uh, I, I think, and that would definitely be a huge storyline for the Skater defense, knowing what we know about this defense and and their and their troubles causing turnovers in big games, uh, and probably just to start. I mean, I think we go back to last year as well in this Florida defense. Actually, too many times under Todd Grantham. Start seven nothing, the opponent. The opponent would just score uh, for first drive. So a fast start <laughs> for this Gator defense, and yeah, and some turnovers. But grand scheme of things, you know, what did you do versus run? What did you do versus pass? Yeah, that that definitely means Florida held this ground game in check because it doesn't allow rising to go off a of play action. It doesn't allow uh, to the tight ends to get open uh, there there down the field. I do think it would mean Florida pretty much holds Utah run game in check. Yeah, I think Tavy Thomas is absolutely key to this game, Will. I mean, you know, look, we know that being physical in the run game and we know that stopping the run are the things that Napier's going to hang his hat on. And you can't get all that creative on defense if – the offense is just running it down your throat. So you're going to have to stop it. You're going to have to make them start to make an adjustment. And obviously if they run the ball like crazy, you're going to get play action opportunities downfield. And, you know, look, Utah wants to do the same stuff that, that Napier wants to do, right? Play action to open up the tight ends and have those guys running rampant downfield. So um, it's actually, you know, these teams in more ways than one, and I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit more, are, are pretty much mere images of each mm -hmm. other. When you think about their statistics, when you think about what they did last year, the, the difference is, is that Florida, Florida now has, I would say, a way higher ceiling at the quarterback position than Utah does, or maybe Utah has a way higher ceiling and we just haven't seen it with rising yet, and that's going to come out. And all of a sudden, then, you know, Florida won't be able to keep up. But uh, I don't think that's the case. I think these are pretty two pretty evenly matched teams. This is one I can imagine going down to the wire, sort of like those LSU games have for the last decade, right, where weird stuff happens, turnovers both ways, everybody looks a little bit unsettled. You know, one team runs the ball well in the first half, and then all of a sudden in the second half, the other team can't be stopped. A 
little bit like the Alabama game last year, right? Where it just looked like Florida was going to get mowed over. And then in the third quarter, they just decided they were going to put their hats down and run over the tide and they were able to do it. So um, I'm, I'm really excited to see what happens. You know, the fact that Napier said they, they're eight deep at offensive line makes me feel really good about the five offensive linemen they're going to play. And uh, you combine that with, um, you know, with, with, I, I think, Again, I don't think they're going to stop Utah's running game. I think the question is going to be, can you contain it to the point where you're able to get a couple of turnovers? And, you know, like I said, it'll be one of those weird LSU games where you don't do everything perfect, but if you come out with a win, um, it'll be because of some weird stuff that happened and a few things they were able to take advantage of at the end. Yeah, well, it, it, it's it's stopping that run game enough to get them in third and long. You know, and that's where your turnovers, that's where your turnovers are going to come. So it's stopping it enough to get enough of those third and eights, third and nines, where Brenton Cox can pin his ears back. And look, I know a lot of people want to sit here and say he's got to play the run better. Absolutely. We know that's the next step he has to take. But coming on at the end of last year, he was a force uh, back there to to get in those sacks. So, you know, he's supposedly put it together this fall, had a really, really good fall camp. If you get the, if you get Utah in third, eight, third, nine, and not only Brenton Cox, but I'm, if you guys listen enough in, in your preview magazine, I picked Tyreek Sapp to be a breakout player. We've heard good things from Justice Boone. We've heard good things from Princely Human Meeland. I mean, you get you get Utah in this third and long situation. I do like Florida's potential to get back there in the backfield. I think Billy Napier was quoting Gator Dave when he was talking about Tyreek Sapp last week. Am I right? <laughs> did, did I get that correct? Hey, he he, know, he knows how to cater to Gator Nation. You cross Gator Dave and, uh, you know, pfft. Throw, throw you right out. That's there we right. Go. That That's means right. he bought the read and reaction preview too, guys. Hey, there you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm all for it. No, that probably should disturb us if they're relying on our preview to to, to scout things. Well, Dave, thank you for joining us for a bit here. Uh, you, you'll be at the game Saturday, right? I'll be there. You'll be there cover, covering all the action. Be sure to uh, check out Gators Breakdown. Dave's always, uh, always around. Latest news, he'll jump on right away. He's there for you guys. Dave, any final words before you head out tonight? No, uh, no, just big game. Hopefully, I uh, hopefully I get a little bit better. I'm not feeling I'm not feeling too well, uh, but I definitely couldn't miss this opportunity to be on with you guys. So uh, thanks for uh, thanks for thanks for inviting me. We'll definitely do it again. Dave's hurt and he's not injured. He's, he's ready. He's yeah. ready for thunder. That's all we need to know. There it is. I, I, I got to get ready in the next few days. <laughs> thanks, Dave. Thanks, guys. All right, we'll do four bits here. Thank you again to Gator Dave for joining the show. Check out. Dave on Gators Breakdown and Channel 4 up in Jacksonville. Will, thanks a lot for uh, getting Dave to come on the show. Yeah, man. D- Dave Dave does a lot of different shows. It's awesome of him to, to give his time to us. I mean, obviously, he and I do a lot with, with the Gators Breakdown podcast. But still, you know, he, he, do, he does – a ton of work for his, for his podcast. So to come over to our podcast, help out, it really means a lot. And, uh, you know, thanks to him for coming on. Cause, uh, it's awesome to be able to talk football with guys who are hard, hardcore Gator fans. And there, there's nobody who's a hardcore Gator fan more than Gator Dave. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Let's discuss expectations for the offense. We spent the two bits talking about the defense. We'll go into the offense here. Anthony to Richardson, obviously the main storyline will, uh, but we'll also talk, we've talked about Richardson so much this offseason that we'll keep this one a little short. I want to kind of correspond Richardson into the running game a little bit here. How much do you expect Richardson to run in week one off the bat against Utah? Or do you expect it to be more in the hands of that deep running back room? No, I expect him to run him fairly significantly early on. I, I think he's healthy coming out of camp. They've had the black jersey on him. He's going to be ready to go. Hopefully, they have taught him to slide, right? So when he gets out in the open field and there's an opportunity where he might get drilled, like we don't want him lowering his shoulder like he did in a couple of games last year. But I do think we want him trying to leap defenders. I do think we want him trying to do, deke guys out in, the, out in open field. I mean, look, this is a guy who ran for 400 yards on 50 carries last year. So, you know, he's a weapon. And you have to establish him as a weapon. And I think you do it early because if you establish him as a weapon early, then you don't have to run him anymore as the game progresses because the defense then has to respect him as a weapon. And that gives you the opportunity to do all that zone running. We've talked about all about all off season where everything's sort of going in one direction. And, but you got to be worried about Richardson coming back the other side. Like I would not be surprised. Those old 49er teams always used to run the bootlegs with Steve young. 
where Young would fake it to Roger Craig or somebody else who was his running back and then bootleg out, and you'd have an open throw to the tight end, but he could also just pull it and run. I expect to see a couple of those real early on where Richardson has the option to run and has 20, 30 yards in front of him, and a couple of those are going to stop the linebackers from flowing to the running backs, and that's going to open up the big gas runs that we want to see. And so you got to run him early. I, I, I think you have to use him as a weapon. The reality is Florida is not good enough to go out there and win a bunch of games with Anthony Richardson being a pocket passer who doesn't use all of his skills. You have to use the things that make him special. Look, you're going to risk injury anytime you put somebody out there. Now, that does mean on third and one, I think you give it to Montreal Johnson. You don't give it to Anthony Richardson to run right up the middle. But I think getting him out in space, making the defense respect it, those are some things they're absolutely going to have to do in order to win this game. The running back room rotation, that's been speculation all through the offseason here. Obviously, we saw DeMarcus Bowman head out in the transfer portal. He was expected to factor into the rotation. So you really have your your top three guys you're looking at here. You mentioned Montreal Johnson, also Naquan Wright. And you are expecting a big season from Lorenzo Lingard. I know you've been high on him all offseason, correct? I mean, I, I think we have to. I, I think yeah. Naquan, Naquan Wright thus far has been sort of a special, a third down type back. He, he's got great moves when he gets out in space, but his yards per carry attempt or his yards per carry average is right around four, maybe even a little bit below. It was definitely below last year. And if you're only getting three yards of carry, three and a half yards of carry, then you're just not able to break a tackle when somebody breaks through the offensive line. Now, look, if you get him out in space, he's he can be really special, but that's part of it is you got to get him out in space. And the best way to do that is screen passes and things like that, where you're sort of getting it out onto the edge. That's not what Napier wants to do. Napier wants to run it right up the gut. He wants to stretch out the defense and then gash them up the middle. And the guys to do that are Johnson and Lingard. And I think Johnson is an effective player. I think what we saw at Louisiana last year suggests he could be a really good back for Florida. But I don't think anybody looks at Montreal Johnson and goes, this guy has the opportunity to be special. I look at Lorenzo Lingard. I look at his tape. I look at him returning kicks at Miami. I look at that freshman year at Miami before he got injured. And that's a guy who had the potential to be special. So if he's able to, you know, s- stick his foot in the ground and rush up field and get through those holes, turn in some big plays, you got Richardson coming around the back end. You can imagine a scenario where Florida is all of a sudden ripping off 12 yards, ripping off 18 yards, ripping off, you know, and all of a sudden it turns into a 52 yard touchdown where nobody catches him. Those are the kinds of things you're going to have to see. It's unlikely to me that we're going to see that from Naquan, right? Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But I think Lingard is the guy who, if you're talking about who's going to bring it to the house when there's a crease and an opportunity, who can outrun the safeties, who can who can get past those linebackers. Lingard sort of has that whole package, and he's going to have to show it. Now, obviously, you know, he was, he was rearing to show it in that spring game and got injured right away. And so, you know, we talk about Anthony Richardson and Anthony Richardson's injury risk, but I think the same thing holds for somebody like Lingard that, you know, the, you know, it sounds like ETN is playing really, really well in camp, but the reality is we want those three guys to be the guys who carry the bulk of the load. And and that includes equal opportunities for each of them, right? I think each of them is going to get an opportunity. And I think Napier more so than Mullen. I mean, we've seen with Damian Pierce with the, uh, with the Texans that it was just sort of an equal distribution of carries amongst the running backs last year, not necessarily a distribution based on the, uh, based on the effectiveness of the running backs. And I think that is one thing we'll see is that if there's a guy who's got the hot hand, a guy who's carrying the rock, a guy who's doing what needs to be done, he's going to be out there a lot more often. And so you are probably going to see games where somebody gets 18 carries, somebody gets eight and somebody gets four, as opposed to last year where you were sort of 10, 10 and 10, no matter what the, what, no matter what was going on in the game. Are you what type of role are you expecting from ETN? I know you just said you're not expecting him to play a ton, but is he going to play at all? Are you expecting any carries for him on Saturday? I mean, I don't know about Saturday. I think he's going to work his way into the into the role. Right, I, the I think yeah, well, and I, I think one of the things that you think about when you think about running backs is that they're you're not trying to put a lot of wear on the tires. So you you don't want to give them 30, 40 carries. And they're usually not four-year players if they're a guy who's going to go to the league. So playing a guy for four games and redshirting him, if you think he's got that kind of ability, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Get him in there, use his ability, give your guys a blow when you need it, and great, right? But um, it's a big environment to put somebody in who's the fourth string running back. Do you need to go that far down in the first game of the year 
you know, I, I don't expect to see a ton of carries in that game. I expect to see a, I expect to see significant carries as the season moves along for a lot of different reasons. But the main one is, is that guys get dinged up over the course of the year. And if you've got a fresh ETN, when you get into game four, game five, game six, that'll be a significant asset for Florida. Um, you know, whether he's, whether he's making carries there in the first game, I think a lot of it depends on where he is with pass protection. I mean, you know, there, there are, th- and, and in the passing game as well, those are the two things you don't really talk about when you talk about running games. It's really hard because until you've actually seen the game, you have no idea how these guys are actually performing. But I can remember with Jordan Scarlett years ago, you know, there was, there were a lot of questions about why he wasn't starting. But then when you looked at the tape, you could see that the guys who were in there instead of him were picking up blitzes and were helping their quarterback. And Scarlett was struggling with that a little bit. And so it made sense that he, he couldn't be a three down back. You couldn't throw on first down you knew that you were running the ball if he was in there. And so those are the things that with a freshman running back, you just don't know. So look, if he's got the pass protection down and if he's ripping off runs and he's outperforming people, heck yeah, I hope he's in there. But, you know, he's got some really, really quality guys in front of him. And out of all the places that I think we look at depth, running back isn't the place where I'm like, oh yeah, we need somebody to step up. Yeah, this Utah defense, very, very tough, tough defense under Kyle Whittingham traditionally, and they've done a great job rebuilding, uh, you know, themselves into a power five team over the last several years, over the last decade in the PAC 12, but they've lost a lot of talent from last year's roster. I, it, so I I've heard about them. I've heard it said about Utah this off season, the numbers look good. If you look at the number of starters returning, but if you look at the number of production, that's lost that the numbers in the terms of production, it's a, big level production that they're they're losing here if you look at just tackles alone over 200 250 plus out of 382 total tackles on the season gone from last season you're looking at the top two uh top three of the four guys in terms of sacks which is over half of the 41 sacks there that they had last season on the defense gone out the door uh one of those guys Devin Lloyd drafted first round by the Jacksonville Jaguars so hopefully that uh works out there in Jacksonville but Nephi Sewell uh, and um, uh, Micah Tafua, three big names that are missing from Utah. We'll talk about Mamu Diabate and his potential impact in six bits here. But, Will, the thing I like about this matchup is Utah is definitely putting some fresh faces in there. They're, they're bring back plenty of experience, but they got to step up in terms of production too. I know that's some a big storyline in terms of what Florida is looking for this season. When, when you're looking at this matchup, though, Pretty solid secondary returning against a receiving core that we definitely have a lot of questions about. Are you relying heavily on the run game to get this done against the Utes? I mean, so here, here's there's a couple of things I think statistically we need to look at just coming into just coming into the game. So first, Florida was 39th last year overall in yards per play. Utah was 34th. So when we talk about like the Florida's defense struggle, that was true. It did struggle at times. But when we talk about Utah's defense. It's true. It struggled at times. It was not fantastic. Now, the distribution was different, right? So they were 37th in yards per rush. Florida was 85th. And then they were 32nd in yards per pass. Florida was 18th. Florida had the better secondary between these two teams. So if this turns into a passing game, I think Florida might actually have an advantage on the defensive side of the ball, right? Now, then you got to go to rising and you got to go to Florida. But that's actually an interesting part, interesting story, too, because Utah was 20th overall in yards per play. Florida was 21st. Florida was, or Utah ran the ball best. They were second, but Florida was sixth. And that's after Ethan White went out. And we, we've we talked about endlessly about that, how Florida's defense slipped. So in yards per pass, Utah was 71st and Florida was 68th. So with Emory Jones in, Florida was actually better throwing the ball than Utah. Now, again, first couple of games, Rising wasn't in there, right? Or at least he wasn't the main starter, but still, I think that's significant. And then the big thing that I think is, if and this, was a, this was a stat that just, just floored me. So Emory Jones averaged seven. yards per touch last year. Hmm. Anthony Richardson averaged 8.1. So, and I mean, we're talking like, it sounds small, right? One yard per touch. That's an enormous difference for a quarterback. And that, so if you look at that and say, okay, well, Utah's offense and Florida's offense were pretty equivalent last year. Utah's defense and Florida's defense were pretty equivalent last year. I mean, look, Florida's losing some guys on defense too. Florida obviously lost Diabate, lost Hopper, lost some guys, or did you know haven't brought in guys. They lost all the defensive tackles that they brought in as transfers, so they've lost some guys too. But 
you know, Utah's lost them as well. The big difference here to me is Anthony Richardson. Anthony Richardson is stepping in for Emory Jones. And the question is going to be, can he maintain that efficiency over 500 touches this year? Whereas last year when he had say 96 touches or whatever it is, he was able to average a yard more per play than Emory Jones. Because if he does, then what that says is that these two teams that are roughly equivalent, Florida just took a step up on the offensive side of the ball. And I think the attacking is going to be what I said earlier in in the in in the the deal with with Dave is that attacking is going to be that Richardson adds a dimension running the ball that opens up some other stuff in the running game and then opens up passes on the back end. And I think Florida's going to have to hit a couple of daggers to win this one. And that's going to be the thing, right? Pearsall apparently is going to be healthy for this one. Can you hit him coming across the middle for, you know, a 60, 70, 80 yard pass. And then you got shorter who was open last year against central multiple times and just wasn't able to get hit. You got Burke who was open against central multiple times and just weren't able to hit him. And I can't remember a time that there was a guy open downfield that Richardson didn't put a good amount of air under it and was able to drill him. Now, again, limited opportunities, but I think that's going to sort of be the story is, is Florida going to be able to deliver in the situations when they get those guys open downfield, because everything they're doing running the ball is to open up those shots and those daggers are just going to have to hit. Yeah. Yeah. So again, definitely leaning on the running game to get it done overall, but opportunity for the big play, big play downfield uh, against that Utah secondary. Will, any final thoughts on the offense before we head into six bits here? Well, I mean, so the thing I, I, this is something I'm going to have in my preview this week, but I think it's important to put in here. So Florida ranked 65th overall in points per drive last year, Utah ranked ninth. But if you start looking when they had 80 yards to go, they were roughly equivalent. Florida was 67th and Utah was 46th. But if you look from 60 to 80 yards to go, Florida was 57th and Utah was 13th. And then if you looked at less than 60 yards to go, Florida was 96th and Florida was 19th. So what that tells me is that this is a field position game that if you can pin Utah deep and you can make Utah have to go 80 plus yards, you're going to be able to stop them. But if you give them a 40 or a 50 yard field, you're not going to be able to. It also suggests that Florida was not able to convert at all when they got the ball deep in enemy territory. And that's going to be key, right? I mean, Florida is going to have to convert when they get the turnovers, when they get a good punt return, when they get a big play to get into enemy territory, they're going to have to convert those drives. And the good news is I think Richardson was much better at it last year, again, in limited time than Emory Jones was. And so the hope is, is that they're going to be able to do that. But, you know, Utah sort of outperformed their overall offensive output when they got closer to an enemy territory and Florida vastly underperformed their overall season output when they got into enemy territory. And so, um, you know, if that evens out this year, I think it probably allows these teams to be a heck of a lot closer than the points per game would indicate. All right, let's switch gears into six bits here. Go with the big storyline coming into the game. Linebacker Mamu Diabate, leading tackler off of Florida's roster in 2021. Coming back to the swamp, he told reporters last week, it's going to be a great environment, a great opportunity. And, you know, it's going to be like going to my ex-wife's house. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good quote. Uh, hey, look, Diabate was a good gator. He was a good gator. He played solid when he was here. It's very weird, though. This is a very weird situation. We haven't seen this a whole lot where a major contributor – not only comes back for a visit, and of course we're going to see Tyron Hopper with Missouri. You know, it's a transfer portal era. It's a different time in college football. We're going to see this from time to time. But Diapati coming in, opening game. You know, he goes to Utah. You, you don't think you're going to see the guy again going to Utah? Comes into the swamp, opening game. We've never seen anything like this here. Well, I I, I think it's an awesome storyline, and I'm wondering what you think. Not what your reaction is going to be. What do you think the Swamp's reaction is going to be the first time his name's called on the tackle? I think it'll be a lot like when you call your ex-wife after you haven't <laughs> talked to her in a little bit. I mean, or right after the divorce settlement comes. I don't suspect <laughs> it'll be a warm welcome. Yes. We all remember. We all remember getting absolutely boat raced by LSU. We remember that uh, you know those counters that were embarrassing the entire time. That Diabate was on the field, and so was Tyron Hopper, right? And so, mm -hmm. I think. We're sad to see those guys go because we would we would have expected them to thrive in Patrick Tony's defense. At the same time, I don't think any of us are crying tears that that version of those guys are going because they weren't stopping guys in the running game. And, you know, I just mentioned the stats in terms of Florida against the, the rushing game and Florida against the passing game. And the defensive backs were really holding up their end of the bargain and, and the linebackers in the defensive line were not. So 
you know, in some ways you wish him well, you hope that he does well, but it, it is sort of a kick in the teeth, right. To go to the team that's going to be playing Florida first next year when, when you decide to transfer. And I'm sure there were other reasons that he decided to do it, but he didn't look at it and say, Hey, I'm going to avoid that. He said, Hey, I'm going to go right back to where I'm comfortable and, uh, and, and come right in there game one. And so we're all going to say, well, you know, when you're the ex-wife coming back, you don't necessarily get the red carpet rolled out <laughs> when you, when you come back. So, you know what? As long as the players will all give him, you know, the players will all give him love. I'm sure when he comes back, cause they all remember him and they, they appreciate what he did. But uh, you know, I, I don't expect it to be a very warm welcome there in the swamp, nor should it be. I think, you know, he's, he's the enemy. Now Florida has a top 10 opponent coming in. There's no time to sit there and be like, Oh, we should take it easy on him. Cause he's with another team. No, he's with another team. Stick it yeah. to him, put him on his butt, run a counter at him. Every opportunity you get and make him for prove to us that he knows how to do it. And if he doesn't, then run it over and over and yeah. over and over again, you know, look, let's see if he learned. And if he did, then great. And if the, if the Utah defensive line is able to stop, stop him, then okay, you're going to have to go to something else. But I think Florida, more than anything, knows where the weaknesses for Diabate are. And so, you know, coming in for the first game, hey, yeah, it has a little bit of sentimental value and has a little bit of, uh, you know, he knows what Florida may want to do, but he really doesn't under Billy Napier. But I think Florida and all the guys who were there when Diabate was there know what Diabate likes and know what he doesn't. And so if you talked about advantages, I actually think it's an advantage for Florida just because they know what they're getting into as opposed to uh, Diabate is going to be seeing a way different offense than the last time he was there. So one of the things I think is a huge advantage for Florida coming into the game is that Billy Napier, you can look at his, you can look at what he did at, at, at uh, Louisiana. You can look at what you think he's going to do and how he's going to apply those concepts at Florida but you don't know a ton about the two together. So I think that Florida has this element of surprise coming into the game that Utah does not with the well-established coaching staff. Uh, one of the things, though, that might undermine that a little bit is just like Florida knows Diabate's weaknesses and everything, Diabate practiced against Anthony Richardson a whole lot, I imagine. And I'm sure he had a lot to share about not only tendencies from Richardson, tendencies from different players on the roster at Florida – but what it's like to step into the swamp and what it actually feels like on a game day, which not many Utah players would, would have a good sense of, I imagine, coming into this game. Because I, I think the swamp – I've been around a lot of, uh, of game day environments in college football. The swamp is totally unique. That feel, especially first Saturday in September, it's going to be way hotter than those Utah boys are used to. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I live in Pennsylvania, right? And I tell people what it's like to go down to Florida. It's like, Oh, it's like the hottest day with the most humidity that you have up here in Pennsylvania. I'm like, Oh, well that's not so bad. And it's like, no, but it's like that for six months. <laughs> like and they, they sort of look at you like, Oh, that would be bad. But then nobody really gets it. Right. And then they go down and, and anybody who lives there for any length of time, they get it. And it's not that it's that oppressive one day out of the year, it's not that it's that oppressive like the one time you went down there and it's not going to be that oppressive for the first 10 plays. It's the 60th play and the 65th play and the 70th play where you just don't have anything left. I remember when I moved down there and I was playing baseball at the time and it wasn't really all that hot out. And they sent us for a jog. I was about to die before the jog ended. And, I mean, granted, I'm not somebody who really is is fit for jogging, but still, like I was not. It was so much harder than doing it in Indiana. And it's it's not the first 250 yards that get you. It's not the first thousand yards that get you. It's when you get close to the end, you're just completely zapped of all energy. And he can tell them about it all he wants. Doesn't matter. That's it. No one there is going to understand it. And the thing is. Like I almost liken it to, and, and this really is sort of my opinion for the game. I think Utah is going to have to come out and jump way on top early and then hold on at the end if they expect to win the game. I think if this thing's close after the first quarter, Florida has a huge advantage because I think Utah is going to come out all hyped. And I think when they come out all hyped, it's going to be like the sprinter who comes out of the blocks for a long race sprinting. Right. And everybody's just sort of jogging behind him. And then all of a sudden he starts slowing down. He starts catching up a little bit. And then you get to the final stretch and it's time to sprint. And he's got nothing left. And the guy who sort of jogged the entire time and caught up to him now has something left in the tank to sprint. And that I think is probably one of the real advantages of the swamp. And I just don't know how Diabate gets that advantage across to these guys because it's just different. Like it just is. And to go out there for the first game of the year, national TV, able to prove yourself as a top 10 team against the SEC, right? These are the programs that didn't want you, 
right? If you're a guy who went to Utah, yeah, it's the Pac-12, but a lot of these guys probably would have gone to Alabama, Florida, LSU, those sorts of programs that they had an opportunity to. It's an opportunity to prove it against them. You're going to go out and you're going to be sprinting. And if Florida can keep it close, you know, it's going to be that jogger coming up behind and and just in the fourth quarter, we'll see if Utah has something left. You know, Diabate may have something left, but I don't know about the other guys. Yeah, Diabate, we appreciate the service and your time in orange and blue, but you're wearing red on Saturday. You're the enemy. Good luck in Pac-12 play, but not not wishing you luck on Saturday. <laughs> you nah. that. You're the enemy on Saturday. All right. You are the ex-wife. You are the ex-wife on Saturday. Yeah, you're the ex-wife. We're not the ex-wife. <laughs> All right, let's move on to a dollar. And, Will, we're putting – obviously, it's a season opener. We're fired up about this game. You talk on the town. I am so glad this is not – maybe there's some people out there that disagree with this, that they would prefer to start off with that easy win against Florida Atlantic or something like that. This is awesome. I love getting right after it. When we opened with Miami a couple of years ago, that was a lot of fun as well. Let's – not waste any time and jump right on it. Might be some sloppiness in game one that y- you would maybe like to clean up before you get to it there. But hey, this is not the season that you ease into because right after Utah, you got Kentucky coming to town next. So this is what I want to say. We're going to talk about this Utah game like it's the biggest thing ever this week. But just to give some perspective on it, even though this game feels huge and it's going to get a ton of attention especially nationally with the you know cross-sectional matchup with the Pac-12 playing the SEC at the end of the day will as will miles likes to say if we don't follow up a win against Utah with a win against Kentucky that's not going to mean a whole lot we, we get that Kentucky game and get in week two to start off SEC play right to get it right that is a huge game even though it's got it's not going to have nearly the national attention to get the Billy Napier era off to a good start. Uh, essentially, the Utah game, I'm, I'm totally looking at this game as a free shot for Billy Napier to make a big statement right off the bat on a national stage. Yeah, I mean, look, I think the Kentucky game is 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 a big deal because it's an SEC game and you only get eight of them. And if you think about last year, Kentucky had a pretty good year, right? 10 and three, but they went five and three in the SEC and were able to finish second. So in the East. And so you're not necessarily, you're allowed to lose one or two of those games and still maybe make your way up in the standings pretty well, but you're not able to lose, you know, three, four, five. And we know we've got Georgia. We know we've got Texas A&M coming up there towards the tail end. And so, look, I mean, those are not games Florida is going to be favored in, nor should they be. And so in a game like this against a team like Kentucky, when, when, when you look at all the advanced stats last year, Florida and Kentucky, even more so than Florida and Utah, were almost equivalent teams. You've got Rodriguez, who's out for the first, what, three games of the year. So Florida mm-hmm. or so running Kentucky's running game Kentucky. should be impacted. Yep. You've got Levis coming back, and I don't. I think most of us think he's overrated. And really, he played terribly against Florida last year. Wandale Robinson is no longer there. They lost both their starting center and their starting left tackle to the NFL. So in terms of catching them at a time where they haven't had an opportunity to get guys in for Mark Stoops to develop them, you've caught them at the right time. And again, I think all of us really kind of expect Florida – I don't, I don't want to say take a step up, but we expect them to be able to play at a much higher level and a much sustained higher level under Billy Napier than they did under Dan Mullen last year. And the big thing, and I think this is the thing that everybody just really needs to take and keep in mind, is I say these two teams were almost identical last year, and I really mean it. Kentucky went 5-1 and one in one-score games last year. Florida went 1-4. and four. That's the difference in the records. Kentucky goes 10-3. and three, Florida goes, what, 6-7. and seven. And that is the difference in their seasons is those close games. So, you know, the blocked kick against Florida, all of a sudden Kentucky gets that win. The game against Missouri that Florida could have won. The game against Alabama that Florida could have won. Those games could have gone a different direction, and they tend to even out over time. They just didn't even out last year. And so I don't think that means that Kentucky's going to go one and five in one score games, nor do I think it's nor do I think Florida's going to go four and one in one score games. But what I do think that it means is that both of them are likely to go two and two or two and three or three and two in those sorts of games. And they're a lot more equivalent than maybe the records last year indicate. I think Kentucky's sort of primed to take a step back. So yeah, I don't think Kentucky's going to be great. In fact, I have them fourth or fifth in the SEC East this year. And so um, look, I think Florida needs to beat them to sort of prime the pump for what the SEC's schedule is going to be for them. 
but also I just don't think Kentucky is going to be that great a team. And so you got to beat the teams like Missouri, like South Carolina. And I think like Kentucky is going to be this year to have a successful SEC season. So yeah, I think following up that Utah win, hopefully with a win at Kentucky is a big deal for a lot of different reasons. Yeah. I, this is a game here. First game of the Billy Napier. It, it's, it, it's a massive, uh, you know, you have the PAC 12 defending PAC 12 champions coming to town here. Well, but it is you got to keep it keep it in perspective on what's the most important this year. So I I hope Napier thinks the same way and they play very loose and we see a few trick plays or something like that against Utah. I I think you could see some interesting stuff out of uh, Napier and his staff here, especially first game. Make a statement. Make pull, pull out a couple of trick plays out of the bag and uh, make make a big statement early on. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I, I I don't know what he sees when he looks at him on tape. I think what I see is that. Napier isn't the kind of guy I don't think who's going to run a bunch of trick plays though. Trent Whittemore obviously is probably the guy you point at and say, that's the guy you could take advantage of that sort of thing. I I think Napier, especially early on is going to just try to play the numbers game. And what I mean by that is that Anthony Richardson gets you out of sorts on the defensive side of the ball. If he's running the ball effectively, because he makes you get out of your numbers game. You have to account for him. And so what that means is we saw it in the spring game, right, where people were so worried about Richardson leaking out the backside that the tight ends were able to find their way across the formation, even in the direction Richardson was rolling. And all of a sudden, Florida had a numbers advantage and was able to sneak that guy down down the sideline. And again, if you can if you can get that kind of numbers advantage and get a 20 or a 30-yard gain to the tight end on a little four-yard dump-off pass, you don't have to run trick plays. And I think that's kind of the thing that I'm looking for is, yeah, if they need it and there's like a critical time and they haven't been able to move the ball and they they think they can get somebody out of position by getting Whittemore out there on the edge with the ability to throw it, then okay, that's fine. But I think the thing we really need to look for is what is Napier able to do on the offensive side of the ball to be able to get a numbers advantage for one of his tight ends or for one of his running backs. That's going to be the huge play in the game that breaks something open. And it may not go all the way to the house, but can you get Naquan Wright, for instance, like in a, on a linebacker across the middle of the field and the linebacker takes a false step because he's worried about Anthony Richardson, all of a sudden writes behind him, Richardson puts it right on his numbers, and you got a 30-, 40-yard gain. Those are the kinds of things that I think Florida hopefully is going to take advantage of just because of the nature of Anthony Richardson. It's not really a trick play. It's just that you get so much attention on one guy. I mean, look, Diabate may have all sorts of tricks about what Richardson is good and bad at. He may be able to give him all sorts of a scouting report. He'll also tell him he's he's an unbelievable athlete and you better know where he is at all times. And you got to believe that that's been drilled in their head over and over and over and over again. And so those sort of misdirection plays that aren't necessarily trick plays, but they're designed to make you follow Richardson and then find guys in the other dire- going from the other direction are sort of the things I think maybe we probably look to see. I think a man once summed it up Scared money don't make money. Well, <laughs> hey, I'm I'm up for it, man. The recruiting is starting to take off. Um, I think we've all been curious about Napier and his two tight end offense, though all the tight ends seem to have been get, getting injured during the spring practice, at least. And I know he'll have some of those guys back, but um, you know, we're not sure what we're going to see when we go out there. The receivers and the tight ends are really question marks, um, and and that's and. You know, we don't know what we're going to see. And maybe maybe some weird trick play from Whittemore is necessary to win this game. But again, you sort of indicated, and I think this is true, is we aren't going to gauge the whole season by what goes on with Utah. A close loss to Utah will still be considered a successful outing for Florida because it's a top 10 team against an unranked team, right? And so if you follow that up with a loss to Kentucky, well, now all of a sudden there's some reason to be concerned but I don't think it's the end of the world. And so do you pull out all the stops? Do you have all sorts of trick plays in your bag or do you wait, hope to win the game against Utah, hope to win the game against Kentucky and then pull it out maybe against, against Tennessee when you need it or pull it out against Georgia when you need it later in the year where, you know, you've had an opportunity to, to run those plays. And I have no doubt that they have trick plays in their bag that they can call if they want to. The question is going to be, you save them. Right. If, if you're able to move the ball, if you're able to do stuff successfully, you don't call a trick play. I don't think in the opening drive, I think you call a trick play when you need it 
and you need to change momentum or you need to get a player. You don't trust your quarterback or your running back to get the yard that you need. Um, that's when you call one of those sorts of plays. And I, I just hope that they have the ability to get that in this game against Utah and that we don't see those trick plays until maybe in a game against Georgia where they are overmanned, where Georgia has more talent than they do and they just need a critical conversion or they need a critical play where they get the safety to cheat up and sort of, you know, sort of steal a touchdown in order to keep that one close or maybe even come out on top. Well, we've made it through the off season here. Will speculation is over. Results are coming. We're looking forward to it on Saturday in the swamp. You'll be there, right? I will be. I'm there with my seven year old son, Max, a bunch of other family members going, going to be at the harmonic woods tailgate um, at some point along the way. I don't know. It'll sort of depend on the forecast and, and how much heat the little guy can take, but uh, we'll be out there. We'll be walking around, be taking this one in live, um, which will delay some of the post game stuff. But uh, you know, look, first game of the Napier era, first over Labor Day weekend. So we have a couple of days off up here for school. So able to convince my wife to be able to take him down. So not, not going to miss it for a minute. That seven year old's going to come out of this game, knowing what it means to be a Gator. And that that's why we do this, right? That's why it's so much fun. And uh, he's been asking about it for like three months now. So he's starting to get jacked. He goes to his first day of school starts tomorrow. And he knows that the first week of school that we're taking, he calls it vacation that we're taking vacation on Friday. So uh, he's excited. And I am too, because I can't wait. Sounds like a blast, man. Looking forward to it. Everybody have a great time at the game this weekend. 2022 is underway. The Billy Napier era is underway. Another season of Gator football. Can't wait to break it down for y'all next week. In the meantime, be loud this weekend in the swamp. Fill it up. Be loud. Go Gators. Go Gators. Thank you for watching this episode of Stand Up and Holler. Be sure to subscribe to the Read and Reaction YouTube channel. Join our Patreon community at Read and Reaction for bonus content each week. And check out our website at readandreaction.com. I'm Nick Newton, joined by Will Miles. And as always, go Gators.